and why the need to continue the work we've done around sheltering in place is so important uh, to continuing to maintain the curve. As a reminder, datasf.org slash COVID-19 is a, on our website, is our website so that you can access data or information that you may need uh, regarding uh, the numbers that we know uh, uh, exist around uh, those who have been diagnosed, but also uh, information by zip code as well as the number of tests and other valuable information that we've done. Now, last week we announced the next steps for gradually reopening San Francisco and I know that people are anxious uh, to see our city reopen. I'm anxious to see our city reopen. Um, and this has been a very uh, tough and, and challenging time for all of us. Uh, when you think about what we've all sacrificed, um, kids who are graduating from high school and, and will not be able to have a traditional graduation or attend prom, uh, those parents who uh, cannot go back to work because they have no childcare access for their children, uh, the people who are elderly who actually really need uh, comfort through family and friends who are not able to visit uh, with those uh, folks that they love and care about the most, especially during this past Mother's Day. Uh, it continues to be a challenge, but especially with regards to our economy. Our economy is, is suffering not just in San Francisco, but throughout the United States. And what we've tried to do here in San Francisco is uh, redirect resources and raise private dollars in order to get support in the hands of those who need it the most. And oftentimes people who may not qualify uh, for uh, any assistance whatsoever. Uh, the people who have been impacted the most uh, in include our small businesses. Um, our small businesses that are really the backbone of our city, employing hundreds of thousands of people who sadly were laid off as the result of this, this crisis. When these businesses are not open, they're not generating any money. They were already having a tough enough time as it was before the coronavirus pandemic uh, with the high cost of commercial rents, with the laundry list of fees that are charged by the city that need to change. Uh, with a number of other taxes and other expenses, it oftentimes made it difficult for many of these small businesses to not only stay open in their existing storefront locations, but also to maintain their staff. And it's gotten even worse as a result of this pandemic. And this is why I was so excited to announce just a step forward in reopening our economy. Uh, and that includes specific small businesses that in some cases, for example, our florist, they were allowed to deliver this Mother's Day. But when you think about their capacity even to do just that, to prepare the arrangements, to take in the payments, to also arrange for delivery so that everyone is getting what they want when they want it, many florists were reached out to and had to decline because they had so many orders and so uh, they had a limited number of people who were able to assist them in delivering those orders. And this is why I'm also very excited that florists and bookstores, folks will be able to do both delivery and pickup services, music and record stores, hobby toys, cosmetic and beauty supplies. Lord's no Lord knows I need a new fresh supply of cosmetics art supplies and, and, and musical instruments and supply stores, sewing, needlework, and uh, good, good stores, uh, peace good stores. Okay, I don't know what that is, but nevertheless, we are opening a number of businesses for pickup and delivery, uh, and we're doing so uh, gradually. And I wanna explain because many have asked, well, what's the difference between what the governor, our governor Gavin Newsom is proposing, uh, which was that businesses would be open this past Friday versus what San Francisco is doing. And again, everything has, and, and I've said this from the very beginning, we follow the advice of the public health officials here in our city and in our region as it relates to the data that we're seeing, as it relates to the number of cases the number of hospitalizations, the number of deaths. And because of all of you who have followed these orders, San Francisco is in a better place 
than most cities, but we're still not in a place where we are seeing a decline. And I think that's important to remember. The more access we provide people with where there is a contact with a number, another human being, the more the possibility that infections can spread. So the fact that we are offering uh, a delivery and a pickup service uh, is a big step and it is definitely a big risk. And we hope that the types of uh, systems that we put into place in order to protect you as you're able to support and use these places as a resource uh, that we will continue to see the curve not only flatten uh, but decline. And again, it's up to uh, the people in this city to continue to follow these orders. And I wanna say again how much I appreciate uh, what uh, folks have continued to do, whether it's standing in line at grocery stores or pharmacies at a safe distance. I notice people are wearing the, the, their mask in those lines. I notice that uh, folks were just following the social distancing order for the most part uh, in most parts of our city. And, and this is going to be the reason uh, why we are able to uh, lower, the ter lower the curve. But uh, we also know that a number of challenges still exist. So as we allow small businesses to begin work around pickup and delivery, uh, we have to keep in mind that we know that the more people are in contact with the public, there's a, a higher probability that they could contract the virus. Uh, we've seen that in a more recent study done by UCSF with the Department of Public Health uh, and the Latino Task Force when they conducted uh, in one of the second census, uh, census blocks in the mission community, they conducted uh, ongoing testing where they allowed anyone to test and discovered that although of the few thousand people that they tested, less than 2% were uh, diagnosed with COVID-19 and many of those folks were in the workforce. They were still working at various locations. So we know that the probability that the more you're out there, the more you're in contact with other people, uh, that's how the virus could spread. And this is why it's necessary for us uh, to continue down this path. Uh, what's great about our city, again, is we've come a long way and testing is so critical to our ability to allow more places to open. The more access people have to testing and also contact tracing, the better our ability to identify someone as quickly as possible, uh, make sure that they're quarantined, but also track the other folks that they've been in contact with in order to just really uh, stop things in their tracks. Uh, I wanna say that um, here in the city, uh, what's great is number one, we will provide testing for anyone who uh, is an essential worker, whether you have a symptom or not.
work that you all are continuing to do in coordinating with the community to make sure that we have this very, very important information. Uh, the real progress is when we get to at least uh, the ability to conduct 200 COVID-19 tests per 100,000 residents. And again, this will help us get to a place where we can begin uh, to understand what's happening in our city, a way to address it, and a way uh, to gradually move uh, San Francisco in a direction of reopening. Testing capacity is critical. And as a reminder, just because you're tested and you are negative does not mean that you're immune from contracting COVID-19 after you discover that you are negative or even in, 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 in any other event. So I, I want to just reiterate how important it is to continue to wear your mask when appropriate and maintain social distancing. We also know that, you know, equity is important. Uh, making sure that communities that may not watch the news, that may not read the paper every day, that may not be in touch with what's happening with city government, uh, that we do a better job of making sure that we outreach to those communities uh, with a number of trusted community-based organizations, uh, as well as an incredible group of community volunteers. And I really wanna thank the equity team and the, Depart the Human Rights Commission under Cheryl Davis. Um, they have been incredible. Uh, these are people uh, we have the Office of Racial Equity, Shakira Smiley is the director there. We've had both Shakira and Cheryl Davis um, working hand in hand, developing strategies from day one to make sure that as we have information, we're communicating to uh, folks in these communities, to the seniors in the Bayview, to many of our sadly homeless residents in the Tenderloin, uh, to folks in various parts of this city that may not have access to what is actually going on. They've been able to distribute the work uh, from Chinatown and other communities. They've outreached to these communities on a regular basis, not just distributing almost a million flyers uh, with information and answering a number of questions from so many of these folks, again, who are not necessarily connected to the internet or connected to resources, but, you know, providing masks, providing access to uh, support for food or connecting them to other resources. The work that they have done around education on the coronavirus and education on around resources to help people weather this storm has been incredible. And I am grateful uh, that they are also continuing to outreach as testing capacity continues, uh, the work continues. Uh, because we showed up in, in one community one day doesn't mean that we should not be going back Back to that community the next day and the next day and the next day. It includes not only individuals, but we have businesses where we have people who have uh, limited English uh, uh, and may not be completely familiar with the policies of the city. So it's the responsibility of this equity team to really reach out to many uh, folks who are not always connected and who may not always have the resources to make sure they have the resources uh, and that we provide them with clear direction around testing. Because as we saw in the study and the mission, many of the people who are part of our workforce are the ones who are testing positive. So we wanna make sure that many of those essential businesses that are, that are open, as well as the delivery that's gonna start on May 18th for those other businesses, the delivery and the pickup, that they know that their workers can get tested. Uh, so I wanna appreciate the equity team and the work that they're doing, as well as appreciate the uh, Human Rights Commission here in San Francisco. Uh, thank you for the work that you've done on outreach. Um, and I also just wanna finally uh, wrap it up with uh, talking a little bit about the hotel rooms because we were preparing for a significant surge. Uh, we were also preparing for the opportunity to make sure that people who are uh, our essential healthcare workers and our public safety officials who were concerned about the impacts on their families, that they had places to go where they were able to isolate themselves. Uh, because of how well the city has been doing in terms of uh, you know, maintaining the curve, 
Uh, we have not used as many of those hotel rooms as we anticipated. Uh, and the good news is we are able to repurpose those hotels. We've negotiated, uh, Trent Rohr and the Department of Human Services and his team were able to re renegotiate those contracts. So now those extra few hundred rooms that were supposed to be used for our frontline workers, and, and to be clear, we still have access to rooms for our frontline healthcare workers and public safety officials. Those rooms will be used for people who need to uh, isolate if they are COVID positive. And we're talking about people who live in our single room occupancy hotels, who if they contract the virus, they can't necessarily social distance themselves in an SRO if they're living there with their family, or someone who's homeless, or someone who lives in a, a congregate living setting, or anyone who lives with family where there's not the ability for them to self quarantine we have the opportunity uh, to extend our hotel capacity to provide this as a resource to the people of San Francisco. Uh, so this is really great, and I think uh, we've come a long way. Uh, the challenges around COVID-19 still remain as real today as they have been since we announced the first case. Uh, and I just want to, again, thank the public uh, for doing everything you can to follow the social distancing orders as well as the mask. Uh, your, your commitment to this uh, has been tremendous and I'm sure uh, continues to be very challenging. It's challenging for me, it's challenging for the team that's working every single day to keep all of us safe. Uh, those who are putting themselves on the line to uh, make sure that the city continues to run in some capacity. Uh, they are the reasons why we're able uh, to, to provide essential services. And so I just want to really continue to appreciate uh, the team here at the Emergency Operations Center, the people who are showing up every single day, uh, the folks who are uh, driving Muni, the people who, the police officers who are uh, working their shifts, the paramedics and others who are out there doing their jobs every single day. And um, they don't have always the luxury to socially distance themselves when they're trying to save someone's life. Uh, so, so many people, the grocery store clerks, the nurses, the doctors, the folks who are on the front line, so many people who want to continue to make sure that they are there to support this city, to support you, and to keep everyone safe. Um, I want to, again, express my appreciation to each and every one of you, and thank you to the people of San Francisco for continuing uh, to lead us down a path of safety uh, and, and getting to a, a better point. Uh, one day I'm going to stand up here and, and hopefully make a great announcement about the fact that because of all of you, we've been able to lower the curve. Uh, that day is not today, um, but just keep that in mind. That day is coming and we will be so grateful when it does. And with that, I'd like to introduce the director of the Department of Public Health, Dr. Grant Koufax. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Grant Colfax, Director of the Department of Public Health for the City and County of San Francisco. And thank you, Mayor Breed, for your leadership during these very difficult and challenging times. It's been a week since the new health order took effect across San Francisco and the Bay Area region. As of today, there are 1,954 San Francisco residents with confirmed cases of COVID-19. And as the mayor mentioned, sadly, a total of 35 San Franciscans have died. I send my condolences to their loved ones, their friends, and their community. Of the people confirmed with confirmed COVID-19 in San Francisco, 156 are experiencing homelessness 
and one of those persons has unfortunately died. This is why we continue to prioritize vulnerable populations in our ongoing response, including people over 60 and those with underlying health conditions. These groups include people experiencing homelessness and those who live in congregate settings, such as shelters and skilled nursing facilities and incarcerated settings. I point this out because even as we continue to move forward with plans to reopen, we must keep in mind that we are still, that we are still in the midst of a pandemic. These are not normal times and normal times will not return for some time. Our recovery as a community will depend on our ability to protect the most vulnerable and to maintain a health system that can respond to continued outbreaks. And recovery is foremost on all our minds. So let's talk about the gradual path to the new normal. In the past week, we have begun to enjoy some loosening of restrictions with the reopening of construction and increased outdoor activities and jobs. We have also announced, as the mayor announced, that if all goes well, some additional businesses can begin to offer curbside pickup and takeout services as soon as a week from today, May 18th. This includes bookstores, florists, music and supply, art supply stores, toy stores, and sewing stores. The last is particularly important for all those home mask makers out there. We will also be easing restrictions on medical care, such as non-essential surgeries and non-urgent ambulatory care visits. In all of these hopeful steps, we continue to put community health first. That means that we will keep a close eye, as we have throughout this pandemic, a close eye on the data so that we can move forward or pause or even increase restrictions depending on the spread of the virus in the community. It also means that we must support businesses and other entities with clear guidelines so that they can operate as safely as possible for their workers and customers and our community as a whole. In that effort, the Department of Public Health has issued new directives to businesses that are allowed to operate now, such as restaurants, delivery services, and grocery stores. These directives will also apply to the expanding group of businesses that we anticipate will be able to reopen to a limited capacity next week. And just to be very clear, the restaurants are operating under very limited capacity now. We are working with the Mayor's Office of Economic and Workforce Development and Economic Recovery Task Force to reach out to businesses and make sure they are informed about the guidelines and can prepare. Here are five highlights of what businesses need to do to be safe in the current coronavirus environment. One, create a health and safety plan. Two, ensure social distancing and face covering at work. Three, provide the proper equipment and cleaning materials, including hand sanitizing and hand washing. Four, protect customers by marking off six feet areas and cleaning high touch surfaces. And five, ending self-service of food items and the handling of produce without purchasing it. Some of these rules will change the way we currently shop and interact at work, or at least the way we used to shop and interact at work. This will take some adjustments, but believe me, they are worth it 
to keep everyone safe and allow for the economy to start to reopen. All of the new health directives are posted on the Department of Public Health website on our coronavirus page. And as we look forward to next Monday, May 18th, and the potential for some businesses to reopen safely for curbside pickup, we will also be keeping a close eye on the data. Specifically, we will be looking at hospitalizations of COVID positive patients as our metric of whether to move forward with expanded curbside pickup and takeout next week. This is a key metric. Since April 6, our hospitalization numbers have ranged from 70 to 94 patients. The curve, the curve is indeed flat. And as the mayor mentioned, it is not decreasing substantially. We have not yet seen a substantial downward trend. Today, there are 71 people hospitalized in San Francisco with COVID-19. If we can keep within the range for the next week, we anticipate allowing the next group of businesses to reopen. If we have a sustained increase in hospitalization, we will evaluate where the new cases are coming from and shift our focus there. The reason is, an increase in hospitalizations, an increase in hospitalizations, will tell us that the virus started gaining strength in our community about two weeks ago, and that more people are starting to get very sick and require hospital care. And there are data to show when our behavior allows the virus to spread, we see spikes in infections. We are seeing spikes in infections in Southern California, commensurate with when the beaches became crowded. We have seen spikes of infections when people have gone to large gatherings at churches or birthday parties. We must be vigilant and we must continue our social distancing, our wearing masks and our emphasis on testing. If indeed, our rate of hospitalizations start to climb substantially, it may not be safe to continue to reopen. Of course, I hope, I very much hope that that, does, that that does not happen. And I am looking forward to picking up some books and gifts for myself. But we must proceed cautiously and maintain our gains. We will be providing more information this week about what the path to recovery will look like for San Francisco. The community, our community, your community has been so vigilant and so effective in slowing down the spread of the virus. But you may well be asking, where is this all headed? What will the new normal be like? This is a complex question, and we are in uncharted territory. We are in discussions with other counties and municipalities, as well as the state, about that very topic. We are working hard at all levels of San Francisco government and with community and business partners to develop our local roadmap. Again, following the science, the data, and the facts. For now, I can emphasize that we will all have an important role to play. You can think of these roles in groups of three. As community members, there are three key things you, your family, your friends can do physical distancing, face covering, and testing. Testing, if you are working outside your home, you should get tested even if you do not have symptoms. As city and public health leaders, there are three critical things that we pledge 
to do. Testing, we will continue to expand testing toward our goal of universal access. Number two, outbreak detection. We will continue to build our public health reporting and monitoring systems to improve our ability to predict and respond to the virus more quickly. And three, contact tracing, which includes case detection and contact investigation and support for isolation and quarantine to reduce exposure and spread of the virus. If we all do these things, the three things you can do, the three things that government and the health department will do, we can accomplish the following three things. Decreased transmission. We have the power to reduce disease and deaths. We have that power. Number two, increased safety and confidence. We will see more opening up of society and people knowing how to act in the safest ways possible. And number three, that will lead to economic recovery, a goal we all share. Together, we can do this, and we must do this together for it to be successful. San Francisco, I can't thank you enough for your perseverance, dedication, and ongoing commitment to each other, your neighbors, and the community. This city has always been a very special place, and it is even more so now. This pandemic, as difficult as it is, has truly brought out the best of us, and I thank you for that and the ongoing commitment to that as we move forward together. Thank you. Bill Scott will make some remarks and I want to thank him for his incredible work and his team's efforts on the front lines in helping us manage this pandemic. Chief Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chief Bill Scott of the San Francisco Police Department. And as always, I want to first start off by expressing my immense gratitude to our Mayor London Breed and our Director of Public Health, Dr. Grant Colfax, for their outstanding leadership during this public health crisis. I'm going to start my remarks by uh, piggybacking on what Dr. Colfax just stated with my thanks to the residents of our city in San Francisco. I want to expand on the fact that without the cooperation and voluntary compliance of the people of our city, we probably wouldn't be doing as well as we are. So thank you again for your support and your voluntary compliance. And that's not to say we don't have challenges because we do, and I'll go into that in a minute, but I want to begin my remarks again with thanking those people that are, number one, following the public health orders, and number two, abiding by the law. And oftentimes, it's my job as your chief of police to get up in, in front of you and report statistics on people who are breaking the law, but it's also very important to say thank you to the people who abide by the law, because without that, our society would be in chaos, and we do understand that, and thank you for abiding by the law. Um, on that note, you know, this weekend we anticipated that it would be a, a busy weekend as far as more people out. And we had a team of officers along with our cadets and volunteers 
Uh, and we weren't the only city department out, but um, I want to speak of what we did this weekend um, in that regard. We worked and focused on 25 parks, one of which was Dolores Park. And I know the mayor has made comments about Dolores Park, and we've had some challenges there with the number of people wanting to enjoy that beautiful park and enjoy the beautiful weather. And I want to again thank the people who enjoyed our parks across the city over the weekend. Um, what we are seeing is people are getting out to get fresh air, to get exercise, to enact with a, or interact with another human being. And that's a good thing. But I want to go back and, and remind everybody of just the basics. We still need to have people keep that six feet of social distance if you are not with people who live in your household. We still need you to wear face coverings uh, when you're out and you're doing your business. If you're not exercising or in the act of exercising, walking, jogging, bicycling, wear your face coverings. And we still need you all when you get home to wash your hands frequently to prevent the spread of this virus. Now our team of volunteers and officers and cadets were out this weekend in the parks. We issued, uh, we gave out 68 or 58, I'm sorry, 58 face coverings or masks. Um, there were over 100 informal admonishments or warnings to people who were enjoying the park. And I will say uh, almost by and large, everybody who was warned informally came and took compliance. So we, we want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you personally for that because that is what makes this work. We'll continue to focus on those efforts. We know as this goes along and the further that we get into this, uh, we're now at nine weeks and going into our 10th week. Um, people are anxious. People have anxiety. People want to get out and, and interact with other people. People want to do their business. Businesses have sacrificed immensely. And we want to thank all those business owners that have sacrificed to make this work. Um, I know as the health orders evolve, and as we continue to go into different phases of this pandemic and, and attempt to reopen to get things back as much as we can to normal, there are a lot of questions. And with some, there's a lot of confusion. And that's why we follow the compliance model that we follow of starting with education. And we will continue to do that. There are a lot of questions about um, how many sites we write or how many people are arrested. Well, we haven't had to, fortunately, we have not had to arrest anybody, but we have issued some citations. But we start with education first, and that's really important now as we begin to go into additional phases and attempt to reopen. Things change almost weekly, and it's really important that we do our part, your police department and your police officers, to educate the community. For those, as the mayor mentioned and as Dr. Colfax mentioned, who may not be watching the news, who may not have access to Internet, or who may just not have heard that things have evolved. So that's why we start with education. And I must say, by and large, we've been very successful with this model and we will continue to use this model of education, then uh, warnings or management. And for those folks that still refuse to abide by the health orders, we do have the, the um, citation as a last resort. So that's been successful and I'll get to kind of where we are on those numbers in a second. But again, thank you all for the cooperation and for making our city a model. As the mayor said, we, we are far better off than many other cities and um, that's a good thing and that's because of you all. So now I'll get to the, the statistics of those who have not followed the public health directives and then I'll get into a little bit of our crime statistics for the week and for the year. As far as citations, we have issued a total of 23 citations since the initial public health order went into effect. And the breakdown is 13 businesses and 10 individuals. Um, that 23 is an increase of one. Uh, the last time I reported, we had 22, so that's an increase of one. And that additional one citation was for a business. We've had uh, a total of 105 formal admonishments and the formal admonishments, what I mean by that, the formal warnings are those warnings, that's your last warning before we have to come back and issue a citation. And that breakdown is 58 businesses and 47 individuals. Um, that's two higher than my last report of 103 on my last report. 
And I, I would like to say, in addition to that, just like this weekend when our volunteers and our officers and our cadets were out in the parks, they issued uh, or had engagement with over 100, I think the number was about 138 individuals uh, where those were informal warnings, where people were asked to either wear face covering or create some social distance, and they complied on the spot. So that's what we're seeing by and large. And for those individuals where we do have to go back, if you've been warned, particularly formally warned, we have issued citations, and we will continue to do that if we have to, but we hope we don't have to. As far as our crime statistics, I want to go into our week to week, which I have reported on consistently, and also our year over year crime statistics. Uh, overall, the news is good. We had a 22.5% decrease in violent crimes, part one violent crimes over this past week. Uh, that means 16 fewer violent crimes. In terms of property crime, we had a 33.6% decrease in property crimes, which equates to 186 fewer crimes. For the total, uh, part one or serious crimes, that decrease was 32%, and this is the week over the prior week. And that equates to 202 fewer crimes in the prior week. As far as our year-to-date crime statistics, we are at an 8.6% decrease in violent crime, part one violent crime, which is 166 crimes fewer than this time last year. Property crime, we're at a 13% decrease in property crime, which equates to 2,125 fewer property crimes over this time last year. And our total part one crime decrease is at 12.4%, which equate, equates to 2,291 fewer crimes than this time, 2019. I will say, though, although we are pleased to have a decrease in crime, we do understand that part of the reason is that there are just fewer people out on the streets, fewer victims, fewer opportunities. And we want to remain vigilant when we do reopen to make sure that we can reopen without people being victimized. So we will have a presence as we always have during this pandemic. We'll continue that and we'll make adjustments as we have to. Uh, I wanna encourage everyone to continue to report crime because that's part of this analysis is you have to report it for us to know about it and to respond to it. So call 911 for violent crimes. Uh, if it's a crime in progress, also call 911. If it's a, a nonviolent property crime that's already occurred, you can call our non-emergency number at 415-553-0123. That's 415-553-0123. Also, you can call 311 or use our San Francisco Police Department website at um, sanfranciscopolice.org to either request crime reports or report crimes that qualify for online reporting. We still have a report uh, call-in center that we stood up during this pandemic that's been very effective, so it makes us more efficient in allowing our public to report crimes, and that will be ongoing. Um, lastly, I want to close with just the basics. As Dr. Colfax has said, as our mayor has said, we need everybody. If you must go out to conduct essential business or to just get exercise, please wear your face covering. Maintain a distance of six feet between you and anybody who is not living in your household. And when you return home, or even if you don't return home, whenever you can, wash your hands frequently. These prevention efforts, although basic, will help prevent the spread of COVID-19 and get us back to normal quicker. So please uh, continue to cooperate and we'll continue to ask for your voluntary compliance and we need to flatten the curb and beat this COVID-19 virus. So I will thank you. And again, um, we appreciate everybody's support. And with that, I think I have a few questions and then we'll open it up to the questions for the, everybody else. We will, be, we will begin questions for questions for Chief Scott. Chief Scott, this question is from Dan Kerman, Cron 4 News. Have any businesses defied the current order and reopened on Friday and over the weekend? If so, will this be allowed to continue? Over the weekend, um, 
we did not have any, we had one additional citation, as I stated. Um, we didn't, look, by and large, we are seeing really good compliance with our business community. Now, we have thousands of businesses in this city, so that's not to say that every single business has been checked. But we said from day one on March 17th when we started this that we would be proactive in going out to ensure that businesses were doing what was asked of them. And by and large, that has happened. On those occasions where we had to go back, and we had 13 examples of such, we have cited uh, after the warning has been given. And some of those 13 uh, were cited on the first offense um, after uh, a, an inordinate amount of education was out in the public uh, realm. So the answer to the question, though, is by and large, we're seeing compliance. And we hope to continue that. And that's why I get up here and ask for voluntary compliance. And that's why we give warnings. That's why we educate. And that's why we have this progressive pathway, to make sure we do this in a fair and just manner. But we need to get it done, and we, meet the, we need to make sure that people are compliant. So, The next question is from Kathy Novak, KCBS. During the shelter-in-place order, are any exceptions being made to, uh, to the law requiring stores in San Francisco to accept cash? The, the ordinance about accepting cash is still active. It's still, it has not been suspended. And, and I want to remind everybody it, it, what the spirit of that is. This is about equity. You know, not everybody has a credit card or an ATM card, uh, and people need essential services. And this is about equity, making sure that everybody in our city has access to what they need. So uh, that is the spirit of this. So if there are people who are uh, not abiding by that, the proper venue is to call our non-emergency line. That's if you need the police officer to respond to help resolve that. That's 415-553-0123. Okay, the next questions are for Dr. Grant Colfax, San Francisco Department of Public Health. Dr. Colfax, the first question is from Liz Krutz, ABC 7 News. Should San Franciscans be concerned about people traveling to the city or the Bay Area from other counties and states that are less restrictive? So I think right now, um, travel, it's best for people to limit their travel to essential travel. This is not the time uh, to go on a trip for recreation, a vacation. Um, even to, to, to visit family and friends. I think it's very important um, per my prior comments uh, that we focus on uh, uh, focusing on the stay at home order, um, wearing face coverings um, and social distancing. Um, I think that with regard to people um, coming into San Francisco from other areas, it's also very important that we as a community um, create norms where the facial covering, um, the uh, the social distancing, um, is 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 encouraged um, and enforced. So I would really ensure that um, uh, that that we do this whether um, people are um, uh, in in San Francisco as part of um, the, their residency, whether they're coming into work in San Francisco, or if people are coming uh, to travel here. That again. The social distancing, the facial mask, um, are, are, are very important. And again, to, to limit travel to all but the most essential travel. Is the Department of Public Health monitoring people from coming from uh, outside the area? So what what we are monitoring um, is looking at the overall activity um, of the area, how much uh, movement there is in terms of cell phone activity, cars, and, and so forth. And what's really um, quite important about this, this is that it clearly shows that um, 
before we put more of these um, restrictions in place, the more people moved around, uh, the more the virus was transmitted. And we see basically a clear correlation between uh, activity in the, in the public realms uh, with transmission of the virus, which is why it's so important as we uh, gradually um, uh, 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 consider and put in guidelines around reopening that we are doing it in a very safe way, again, with social distancing, uh, uh, with, with facial coverings, and really following the data and monitoring uh, the activity in the city, as well as, of course, the very important metrics around the number of cases and the number of cases hospitalized in the city. The next question is from Christian Kathan, KTVU. The Trump administration is calling for testing of people residing and working in nursing homes. How are San Francisco's efforts progressing? Well, we're way ahead of the Trump administration. Um, uh, we uh, we uh, require are now requiring that nursing homes uh, test um, staff and uh, residents in nursing homes on a routine basis. Uh, that health order was issued uh, last week, and we last week started uh, testing uh, staff and residents at Laguna Honda Hospital, and this will be extended um, to nursing homes uh, across the city. Very important, this is routine testing, uh, testing people regardless of symptoms on a regular basis. Uh, uh, Testing in the case of people having symptoms, whether staff and or residents will also, of course, continue. Will the Department of Public Health test private facilities to monitor COVID-19 for infections? The nursing home facilities? Yes. Yeah. So, so the nursing home facilities in the city, um, with the exception of Laguna Honda, which is direct under direct um, uh, auspices of the health department. Um, the nursing homes are uh, regulated and overseen by the state. Right now, our focus is on doing, in, conducting good public health interventions, and we are supporting uh, those facilities going forward in uh, scaling up their testing capacity. Uh, so the health department will be working very closely with those private homes and with the state to ensure that there are uh, uh, testing. Uh, uh, protocols made available that in certain instances that materials and uh, technical assistance is provided. And the intent is that over time, uh, these facilities will be able to uh, conduct testing um, either um, on their own or through a third party or with ongoing um, assistance um, by the health department in a way that is sustainable and reinforceable. Last question is from Julian Mark, Mission Local. How much has homeless cases risen since last week? How many are severe or requiring hospitalization? So on um, the number of uh, people diagnosed with COVID-19, of the, um, of the uh, 1,954 positive cases in the city, and this is um, with, with the thousands of tests that have been done, 8% um, or 156 of, uh, people uh, report experiencing homelessness. Um, this was defined, as, this is defined as self-reporting homelessness, uh, being included in a, in a shelter outbreak um, or indicating um, homelessness or a shelter um, location as matched by uh, health department records. Um, and as I said, um, unfortunately, um, one person uh, who, who experienced uh, homelessness uh, ha has died of COVID-19 related causes. Thank you. This concludes our questions for today's press conference. further as we grow and learn and I think Brad and let me just add a little bit to that